a one, two, three. <laughs> You've got contrasting right hand techniques. I mean, I, I noticed that Molly, you pick nearer the bridge, for instance. You use a thumb pick quite a lot. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I was just playing with a straight pick in this yeah, particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But can can you talk a little bit about right hand technique, ladies first? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I use a flat pick, so I'm kind of like following the bluegrass flat picking style. And um, as far as my right hand technique, I'm just kind of gripping the pick between my index and thumb. I'm gonna hold it like this, if you can see that. And I do play somewhere between the sound hole and the bridge, usually kind of on the back end of the sound hole. When I'm strumming the guitar, I float my wrist, so there's no part of my hand touching the strings or the guitar. But when I switch to lead, usually I kind of flatten out my wrist a little bit and anchor kind of on the bridge or on the lower strings. Yeah. So it kind of, You'll see some fluidity in my wrist, whether I'm playing rhythm or switching to lead parts. Right. So can you, can you demonstrate a bit of that when, you, yeah. when you're doing the lead parts, where you rest your hand? So I'm just very gently kind of brushing my hand on the, usually like the bridge pins or maybe the lower strings if I'm playing up high. Um, and then when I, so I might be playing a lead. And switch to rhythm, my wrist comes up and I'm just floating. Right. Yeah. How does that it's, contrast with you, Tommy? It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful right hand technique that Molly has because yeah. it's kind of free floating, you know. Um, if I was, <laughs> mine's pretty much your standard Acme page one in the Mel Bay book type technique, you know. Um, so. <laughs> kind of floats around but but it, it's it's um, both Molly and I use that kind of straight up and down you know yeah. it, it, if we're playing uh, let me see 
if we uh, if we played a little bit of uh, say say if we played a little bit of um, uh, White Freight Liner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, oh yeah. Uh, so she uses a capo on the uh, on the third, uh, fourth fret and plays in a C position, yeah. and I play just a straight E. Uh, I stay in E. So, and you you'll see how when she when she's playing rhythm and then switches to lead, that, it, that it's just so effortless. And this is this is the hardest part about about playing acoustic guitar is getting that effortless approach. You know. So um, making it nice and relaxed is a good idea, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah it's like you almost want to feel like you're about to drop your pick. You don't want to be, like, gripping onto it. <laughs> that's right. But you don't want to hold it too loose that you actually drop it, because that's happened to me before. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> you want to play, play a little bit of it? And we'll, yeah. We'll sing a little bit. So, uh, just so you, you can see her switch from... Rhythm to lead and all okay. that stuff. Yeah. Okay. And Are you we're ready? playing in two different positions, which is like I like to do that when I play with another guitar player. Yeah. If yeah. they're not putting on a capo, I'll put on my capo. And it's common in like bluegrass guitar to play out of G, C, or D. And mm. I think guitar players in most other genres play out of E a lot more than we do in bluegrass. So yeah. I often don't play out of an E shape, but. You, I, I was trying like to remember back when I, when you taught me this song on the cruise. <laughs> yeah. We we were doing an Americana cruise. That's when Molly invited me to play with her, and and she said, "Oh, it's in E," and she played it, and I, I went to get a capo because she had a capo on, and then I realized, <laughs> "Oh, it's in E. I'll stay down low, and she can go up higher." Yeah, so. that way we're not stepping on each other's yeah. toes yeah. too much. Exactly. <laughs> All right, can we play a little bit of it. Yeah, sure. it sing a little bit of it. Totally. Okay.
were talking a little bit about the bluegrass tradition of playing using open strings and, and things like that and playing mm -hmm. you know down at the nut or at a capo can we work out the, the sort of contrast between players who I mean our readers will look at positions you know they'll look at pentatonic positions or or whatever can you talk a little bit about the tradition of using open strings yeah mm -hmm. um I think like a lot of it for me comes from you know wanting to get the notes sounding really fluid and when you're using open strings you can have those notes kind of ringing out over each other um I don't know why it's like so common in bluegrass to use mostly open strings. I mean, kind of a lot of the, the instruments um, in the bluegrass style do that. Like you hear a banjo and they're, they're often rolling on open strings and all the notes are kind of ringing out over each other. Bluegrass guitar players use a ton of open strings, um, whether you're like cross picking, you know, that kind of sound, it almost sounds like a banjo where you have those yeah. overtones of the different notes. Um, so when I started playing, I mostly was just learning fiddle tunes kind of in first position, um, using a bunch of open strings. And then it took me years to kind of, you know, venture up the neck and start playing more in closed positions just because um, a lot of the bluegrass basics that I was learning were in those down the neck positions or using a capo. Um, but I think that's just part of the sound is having a lot of kind of open, open ringing notes um, playing over each other, which can be really pretty. And yeah, I think even when bluegrass guitar players are playing up the neck, you still are kind of holding these shapes down to create that sort of fluid sound when mm -hmm. you're playing. Yeah, what yeah, I think a lot of that comes from banjo. Yeah. Right, so like that. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of sound, yeah. that kind of thing you know and you're always looking for ways of being able to use open mm -hmm. notes and open strings uh, and sounds against one another you know just so it sounds a, a little sweeter or you know uh, unusual to, to, to the yeah, ear totally. you know sometimes it can be almost like a like a trick to like play faster or play or kind of switch from the high up the neck into like a lower position, throw in an open string, it gives you time like, to kind of reposition your fingers. Yeah. Well, that is kind of like. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're like d definitely ripped off from banjo players. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it was Jerry Reed and Chet Atkins who brought that to our attention, you know. Um, and then, of course, Tony Rice uh, added so much of that into a lot of the records he was making, and, and you know, it's a beautiful sound. Do do either of you use tunings at all, or do you stay in standard? We both use different tunings. Mm -hmm. um, I first started using alternate tunings on the guitar when I was a teenager, and I was learning clawhammer banjo. Again, it kind of came from this. Uh, came kind of inspired by playing the banjo and, and loving the sound of the banjo. I started tuning my guitar into an open G sus4 tuning and doing claw hammer style on the guitar. And um, so claw hammer is like a style that people normally play on the banjo, but someone showed me that I could take the same kind of right hand technique and play it on guitar. So you kind of, it's, you don't use a pick and you play usually in an open tuning because you want again those like ringing notes um, to sound out and you're just kind of hitting the higher strings with your index and middle fingernails and then plucking a low string with the thumb. Um, so I started using open tunings when I learned claw hammer and then I went to Berkeley College of Music for a couple years and got really into Joni Mitchell's music. I had a teacher who was always showing me these different Joni Mitchell songs and that's where I learned about like Dad Gad and these other cool tunings that she used um and yeah kind of I still mainly I usually bring like two guitars out with me on tour and one will be in my G sus4 tuning and one is in standard but I noticed yeah. you have like three guitars and different tunings yeah well um, um it, claw hammer is one of my favorite things that Molly does mm -hmm. so you should grab something uh uh a tune uh, of her playing with with some claw hammer Mm -hmm. I think that, that, that'd be great. 
I'm now in my G tuning for claw hammer guitar, and this tuning is D, G, D, G, C, D. So it's all G's and D's except for this weird C. And yeah, you actually so tune the B string up. So it's like <laughs> that. The, yeah. His G, so you had to... You know, that yeah, and that be. creates this kind of... It's not major, it's not minor, there's no third, there's just a fourth, so... Um, it works really well for like a lot of modal songs where mm. it's kind of in between major and minor. And actually, I'm I also play the banjo, and a lot of times on banjo, especially clawhammer banjo, you'll tune the banjo is usually tuned to G, but you can tune the B string up to C when you're playing like a modal kind of minor-y sounding song. So that's a common tuning on the banjo. And um, this guy who plays clawhammer guitar in the Bay Area where I grew up, Michael Stadler, he taught me. This style and he taught me this tuning on the guitar mm -hmm. um and so yeah the first song i ever learned on claw hammer guitar was um little sadie and uh, that uses this sadie. kind of rhythm that's common in claw hammer they call the bum diddy pattern so it would be like bum diddy so you're going index and middle fingernail bum like if you were using a pick it would be like down down up down down up um but little sadie uses that rhythm all over the place so it's um writing my own songs using this style. I have one, Take the Journey, that goes like... Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I love that drumming along with it. <laughs>